Edwards and the Church, a lecture series sponsored by the Jonathan Edwards Center and the Carl F. H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding at Trinity. We are very glad that you're here with us today. We're looking forward to a stimulating lecture and a good pastoral response, as well as some exciting conversation with you all in the audience afterwards. So we hope that you're eager to engage us. We only have until about 2.30 for this, because Dr. Marsden is also going to be appearing in a class of mine later today. So please don't be shy. Uh, what we'll do is I will introduce both of our speakers in just a minute. After I have done so, each will come and speak in turn without further introduction. When both of them are done, I'll return to the lectern, and probably the three of us will stand here on the platform, and I'll try to moderate a time of Q&A and discussion with all of you. We are recording this session, so what we're going to have to ask you to do, if you'd like to make a comment or pose a question, is get up out of your seat and go to one of the two microphones uh, that are set up on each side of the chapel. Uh, if we have to have a little bit of a line there, that's better than having big pauses between questions, so, so please get out of your seat and be ready for that. Uh, when it's your turn, please identify yourself briefly, pose a brief question to one or both of our speakers, and we'll proceed that way and try to end right at about 2.30. Our main speaker this afternoon is the most influential historian of American religion at work today. George M. Marsden is the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame. He's the author of many books, the most important of which for us today is Jonathan Edwards' A Life, the winner of numerous awards, published in 2003 by Yale University Press. Dr. Marsden is a serious Christian scholar, indeed a leader of those interested in the difference Christian faith can make in our academic work. He's a longtime member of the Christian Reformed Church. He has taught for many years at Calvin College. In fact, he's doing so now as well during his retirement. He's also taught at Yale, Berkeley, Duke, St. Andrews, Harvard, and most importantly of all, at TED's way back in 1976 and 77. Our respondent today is Pastor Colin S. Smith of the Orchard Evangelical Free Church in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Born in Edinburgh, Scotland, Pastor Smith did his training at the London School of Theology, where he eventually earned an MPhil for his work on Calvin's doctrine of justification in relation to the sense of sin and the dialogue with Rome. He served as pastor of the Enfield Evangelical Free Church in North London for 16 years, during part of which time he also served as the president of the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. He has served as senior pastor of the Orchard Free Church since 1996. He's the author of several books and has a regular radio program entitled Unlocking the Bible. He's also a regular presence on our campus here at Trinity. We're simply delighted that both George and Colin have agreed to be with us today. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor George Marsden. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be back at Ted's uh, as uh, Doug said, I was here uh, for a year as a visiting professor in 1976-77, I believe it was. In this lecture, I'm not going to attempt to say anything new or cutting edge about Jonathan Edwards. I've been working on Jonathan Edwards for quite a while, and the fact of the matter is, I can't think of a lot of new things <laughs> to, to say about him. I've actually written two biographies of Edwards, one the big one uh, that Doug mentioned, and then subsequent to that, uh, I wrote one uh, for the Urban's series in American Biography, uh, a short, it's called a short life of Jonathan Edwards or something. Uh, 
Uh, and I had told Urbans before I did the big book that I would do a, a book for them, and then when the opportunity to do a book for Yale came up, I, I couldn't pass that up, but I, I did it with the proviso that I'd go back and, and write a short one. So uh, if someone wants a 140-page version of the book, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not an abridgment, but it's a retelling of the story. And I did have one friend who wrote to me after the short one came out, and he said, George, why didn't you tell me you were going to do a short one? I could have saved a lot, <laughs> a lot of time. Well, what I want to do today is say what I think are the most important things to say about Edwards. It's, it's pretty much the application part of the sermon, or what the Puritans call the improvement, and or, or you know, if you only have 45 minutes to say to talk about Edwards, what would you say? And that's, that's pretty much the, the question I'm addressing. And so I, what I want to talk about is what theological insights of Edwards might be most helpful for the 21st century world today, particularly for the American uh, world of the 20th century. And I, I, I want to do that uh, particularly by contrasting uh, Edwards' outlook to uh, the outlook of his most famous contemporary American, Benjamin Franklin, who had a great deal to do with shaping uh, America as we know it uh, today. So I'll, I'll begin uh, where my short biography uh, be begins. At the beginning of October, in uh, 1723, two very remarkable young New Englanders both dearly wanted to get to New York City. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, had just left the apprenticeship of his, uh, of his brother and uh, took a sloop to New York in order to look for printing work uh, at, at, in that city. When he got to New York, uh, there was only, New York was a town of maybe 15,000 people. There was only one printer in the town. And uh, he said, there's no work for printers. Uh, I don't need any help uh, here in New York. Uh, but I do have a son in Philadelphia uh, who has a printing business. And you could go apply there. And the rest, as we say in the profession, is history. Uh, meanwhile, this the same month that, that uh, Franklin was going to New York, Jonathan Edwards is back home uh, in, uh, near Hartford, Connecticut, East Windsor, uh, Connecticut, their home, and was uh, deeply hoping that he could get back to New York City. He had spent the previous winter there as a supply pastor for a little Presbyterian church in New York, and he had loved New York. And New York at that time was probably a very beautiful place to be, and uh, he, he really enjoyed New York and dearly wanted to get back to this little Presbyterian church. Problem was that as Presbyterian churches tend to do, this one had split. And uh, because of the split, uh, they couldn't really uh, afford to have a pastor and the whole uh, possibility of his getting back to be the full-time pastor of New York uh, fell through. He was very disappointed and had to wait uh, quite a few more years before he got a pastorate that seemed to him uh, to be worthy of his, uh, his, his ambition. He su eventually succeeded his grandfather, very famous grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, uh, at a church in Northampton in Western Massachusetts, uh, the largest town in Western Massachusetts at that, at that time, though a small town by our standards. Franklin and Edwards were about as different in uh, temperament and in commitments as two people might be, but they also had a lot in common. Uh, they were both brought up in very conservative Calvinist homes. Edwards was 
a little more than two years older uh, than, than Franklin Edwards was born in 1703, late in, the, in that year, and Franklin was born early in 1706. And Franklin, like Edwards, was brought up in a, a strict Calvinist uh, home. And one can see them as people who are reacting to the challenges of the modern world. Uh, they, in, in Massachusetts, in, in the colonial era, they're very much shaped uh, by the, the British world and the cosmopolitan British world and, and young men who were uh, smart and reading everything they could get their hands on uh, were very much affected by uh, the principles and ideals that we associate uh, with, with the Enlightenment. And so you can see Franklin and Edwards as uh, representing two contrasting reactions to the modern world of their day. And in a way, you could see them as a prototype of the reactions that you often see in immigrant communities uh, to uh, the, the culture, uh, the, the, the new cultural kinds of circumstances. And, uh, Calvinists in New England were uh, one of the first American immigrant communities. I live in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan now, where there's a lot of Dutch Reformed, and uh, I spent a lot of time in that community, and you get very, uh, you see very clearly uh, the tensions between people who want very much to hold on to the old ways and people who very much want to modernize and to bring things up to date. And Franklin and Edwards uh, represent uh, that kind of uh, uh, that kind of contrast. And and in fact, if you look at it that way, then you can see that Edwards' theology is in some ways uh, an answer uh, to the challenges of the uh, the uh, Enlightenment trends that uh, Franklin would be someone who is endorsing those Enlightenment trends, and Edwards is, is, is providing an alternative uh, to, to them. And uh, the contrast between Edwards and Franklin is helpful for understanding the relevance of Edwards today because Franklin's America is uh, in, in many ways uh, the, the, the America, or Franklin embodies uh, what America is, is going to become, or many aspects uh, of it. So let me begin by, by, uh, by asking the question, what are the traits uh, of uh, Franklin's time that are still shaping uh, American culture to, today, particularly the dominant American cultures today? And, and the first trait of, that, of Franklin's time that Franklin embraces is that the world, the universe, is essentially impersonal. It's an impersonal universe. And the greatest revolution that Franklin and Edwards were facing as young men, early 1700s, was the scientific revolution associated with Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton had published in the 1680s. Isaac Newton was still uh, living. Uh, the the uh, whole outlook of science was revolutionized uh, by Newtonian physics. So anybody who is grappling with the modern world has to grapple with a whole new way of understanding uh, the physical dimensions of, of the universe. And even though Newton himself was a, a, a Christian who uh, spent a great deal of time trying to figure out how God uh, fig figured into the Newtonian universe. Uh, the Newtonian principles nonetheless provided the opening for people who didn't uh, care to think about God uh, particularly intervening uh, to say that God is really unnecessary for understanding uh, the, the universe, because uh, one can understand uh, how the laws of the universe operate as uh, wonderfully designed uh, 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 interactions, uh, where everything affects everything else, and you don't really need to have divine uh, interventions to understand uh, the essentials of the reality 
uh, that, that we experience. And Franklin adopts essentially that view, essentially a deist sort of view. Uh, it was before Darwin, uh, which came a century and a half later, it was very difficult for people to dispense with the idea that there had to be some intelligence behind the universe. They couldn't think of a way that, that, that there would be no intelligence that would create the intelligence that we, we see. Uh, but uh, skeptics could say, we don't know anything about this intelligence. Uh, God is a distant figure, perhaps a benevolent sort of figure, but created the world right and uh, is distanced from it and doesn't really have to intervene. He, he made it uh, run by, by natural laws. And that's a possibility that the Newtonian universe opened up and which uh, Franklin uh, embraced. And the fundamental corollary of that modern idea is that the universe and our personal lives are best controlled by instrumental reason that is used for constructive humanistic purposes. Now, Franklin's genius was to think about instrumental reason, reason of how do we construct mechanisms that will make our lives better, more comfortable, how do we uh, construct uh, you know, with lightning rods or uh, insurance companies or fire companies, how do we construct a new, uh, a new nation eventually and, and uh, construct it in a way that is designed uh, for, for, human, uh, for human benefit. And so uh, there is instrumental reason oriented toward serving humanity. And Franklin uh, is, uh, is, is a genius in, in promoting that sort of use of reason. And even he sees a, a, an important place for religion in promoting uh, human happiness. He, he likes George Whitfield, the evangelist of, of the day who comes through America and, and, and inspires the Great Awakenings. Franklin uh, becomes very close friends with Whitfield because he sees that kind of religion as doing good for people. And, and so religion has uh, instrumental uh, purposes. So it's a disenchantment of the universe that's taking place in the 18th century, but a disenchantment of a very uh, attractive uh, sort, one, one that is uh, working in Franklin's hands, is used to work for human benefit, to find better ways to organize society oriented toward uh, human welfare. Uh, it's uh, a mechanistic universe, but also uh, one in which uh, human uh, development, uh, the, the, the development of the best uh, in humanity uh, is the ideal that, pe that people work for. Uh, by the, the, the next century, uh, uh, Charles Taylor in his uh, tome, The Secular Age, describes uh, this sort of outlook as being the, the default position for intellectuals in, in the modern world, and that is uh, that there is no good beyond human flourishing. Uh, there's no good beyond human flourishing, and we look for the best ways to promote uh, human uh, flourishing. That's what the intellectual life uh, should be a, a, a about. And that sort of ideal is also one that comes to permeate even many uh, modern uh, churches in the last, uh, in, in, in recent centuries. Uh, there's a book by uh, Rob, Robert uh, Jensen called, uh, on Jonathan Edwards called America's Theologian, a recommendation of Jonathan Edwards. And in that, uh, in, in promoting Edwards, he remarks critically of contemporary mainstream Protestantism uh, that one of its principles is uh, the premise that God never violates human personality. Uh, so that he sees uh, too much of, of theology built uh, around as essentially this sort of humanistic ideal. Uh, a few years ago, I, I, I saw a, a more popular version of, of this sort of Franklin-esque ideal, uh, a church sign that read the last four letters in American are I can. 
uh, clearly, uh, uh, and you can't tell whether it might be a mainline church or, or it could be an evangelical church. It's probably not a strictly Calvinistic <laughs> church. <laughs> One of the, the dominant uh, features that, that has reshaped our world in, the, in this humanistic direction uh, is uh, the use of technology for, for making life uh, more convenient. And again, uh, Franklin is a great progenitor of, of that sort of ideal. Uh, in, in, in our world today, uh, we are surrounded by technology and we all now uh, carry it around uh, with us. Uh, Charles Taylor puts it in, in this way in philosopher's way, uh, that we all live in a constructed social space where instrumental rationality is a key value and time is pervasively secular. Uh, my, my way of putting it is that uh, we all spend a lot of time, even people who are religious, uh, we engage in what I would call methodological secularization, that uh, because of technology, we spend a lot of time just figuring out how things work, and we figure that out essentially in secular uh, sorts of ways. And, and a great uh, deal of our lives, even if, if we, we may, may be spiritual in a lot of ways, nonetheless, we look for the proper techniques to make things work without much reference to uh, spiritual uh, guidance. So, so uh, I think the easiest illustration is you're landing at O'Hare in a storm and you don't want the pilot to come on the intercom and say, don't worry folks, I'm just, I'm gonna be following the leading of the Lord uh, for the rest of the way in the landing. It's all right. For, for he or she to offer a prayer, but we want them to use the instruments uh, for, to, get, uh, to get the plane on the ground. And that's a kind of methodological secularization that practically speaking, it's the secular technique that really uh, we, we, we want to use and we need to use in, in a lot of our lives. Uh, in the 20th century, Jacques Ellou, uh, the French philosopher, a sociologist philosopher pointed out the impact of technological thinking is not uh, simply, uh, and I hear someone uh, helping me out with an illustration, uh, it's not simply in, in the uh, literal technologies, but also in lives that are shaped by the technique of, of, of business, of how do we get, the, the, the bottom line question he says is, how do we get, find the most rational and efficient way to get the job done? And then people's lives are shaped around the demands of uh, business to make, uh, make that happen. Uh, and uh, so uh, a great deal of our lives is shaped by uh, what is practically speaking uh, secular concerns, and then uh, we often, those of, uh, if we're religious, we supplement those sec secular concerns with spiritual uh, uh, matters, but those are regarded as uh, kind of a, a matter of private, uh, a private option or choice. And this methodological uh, secularization and, and instrumental reason are so attractive because they work so well in, in so many uh, aspects uh, of, of lives, that technologies of the market and consumerism uh, raise economic opportunities for, for lots of people, provide them access to life's uh, pleasures. Uh, there's the benefits of health and medicine. And, and even though uh, we all know that the uh, instrumental reason and technology won't get us uh, everything, uh, nonetheless, uh, it helps. And I, I think the, the, the greatest, the, the advertisement of the decade in the last uh, decade is um, the long running MasterCard advertisements that uh, basically say you can't, you know, you can't buy the happiness that grandma has at a surprise party or, 
uh, that the, the, the glee that you have if someone tries a, a foolhardy golf shot. Uh, but uh, for everything else, there's a MasterCard. For, for everything else, there's a practical uh, down-to-earth uh, sorts of things that, that, that make life work. Now, of course, there's, we're all aware that there's downsides to technology uh, as well. There's the uh, threats to the environment, the threat of uh, weaponry that, that, that could obliterate us. Uh, and I don't need to, to uh, elaborate on, on the dangers. But the question is not so much a balance sheet of the modern world, as I think it's sometimes uh, put, but rather uh, the question of uh, what's at the core of this instrumental, humanistic world that uh, grows out of the ideals I'm, I'm tra tracking back uh, to Benjamin Franklin. And I think uh, that the, uh, what, what most people who look at uh, that sort of constructed world find is that it's empty at the core. And I think this would have been one of the great disappointments to Benjamin Franklin because he, like a lot of other 18th century uh, thinkers, had great hopes uh, that if the distractions of superstitions could be put aside and people just think rationally about how to organize the universe and how to just get along with each other better, uh, we could construct uh, a, a, a better world uh, that really was uh, a, a, a provided a more meaningful existence. So that in very broad terms is, is, is a picture of uh, the, the kind of modernity that was beginning to emerge in the 18th century and has blossomed, if, if that's the right term, into the world, a technologically driven world of today. So what can we learn from Jonathan Edwards as an alternative uh, to such a world? Excuse me. What can we learn from Edwards uh, as an alternative? First of all, I think the reason why Edwards provides some particularly sharp insights on modernity is because he lived at the intersection of two uh, eras. He was reared in the largely pre-modern world of uh, the Puritans. Uh, his father was a pretty strict third generation Puritan uh, clergyman and was shaped very much by the, the, the ideals of the original Puritan settlements of, of uh, the, the uh, 1600s. Uh, but Edwards was growing up in a world that's shaped by the same forces that attract Franklin, the same uh, forces of, of uh, modernity. And Edwards is reading everything he can get his hands on, is very much aware of what's going on in England, in the intellectual world in England. And uh, he reads John Locke and Isaac Newton. Uh, he's very much excited about uh, science. And he uh, says that uh, this caused a crisis of faith by the time he was a teenager. He, he writes, from my childhood up, my mind had been wont to be full of objections against the doctrine of God's sovereignty in choosing whom he would to eternal life and rejecting whom he pleased, leaving them eternally to perish and everlastingly tormented in hell. It used to appear like a horrible doctrine to me. And Edwards was uh, very deeply impressed by the Newtonian science and the interconnecting relationships of the universe that, that Newton uh, was describing. Edwards, uh, like Franklin, did some scientific experiments. He, he, uh, he, he uh, wrote, uh, wrote up a, a, a natural history of, of uh, uh, regarding spiders. Uh, and uh, he also, as, as a young man, uh, speculated on the na philosophical nature of, of uh, reality. Uh, and by the time he was in his late teens, he was doubting whether he had the proper evidences of a true 
Puritan or Calvinistic uh, conversion. That conversion uh, was uh, a conversion experience. Uh, it was very important to, uh, to the tradition. His father uh, had revivals in his churches, and Edwards found himself uh, to be uh, lacking in the kind of commitment uh, that uh, he, he thought he probably should have. And then uh, he says that he came to what we, we might call a paradigm shift. Uh, and he didn't equate this change of mind with his conversion, uh, but it was a dramatic uh, change of mind. And he puts it this way in his later narrative. He says, uh, rather suddenly I had uh, quite another kind of sense of God's sovereignty than I had then. And I have, have often since not only had a conviction, but a delightful conviction. And he goes on to speak of uh, his inward sweet delight in God and divine things. So how did the sometimes off-putting doctrine of God's sovereignty become for Edwards a sweet and delightful doctrine? And the, the intellectual breakthrough and the experiential, I think, are, are closely related. Uh, in effect, what he uh, had done was to resolve the conflict not by accepting modern thought and then adjusting God's sovereignty to see how it would fit in with the latest modern ideas. But rather, he started with the essential starting point of Christianity, the triune God who created the universe, a triune, uh, unfathomable, but loving God who created the universe, and then thought about how modern thought uh, would fit into that framework. And the crucial insight that he has from starting with that Trinitarian framework is that the universe is most essentially personal. It's at its core a universe of persons. It's a product of a loving being, uh, and it's a product of a loving being who's Trinitarian, uh, that uh, within the Trinity uh, there is love. And then Edwards asked the question, why would a perfect being want to create a universe? He doesn't need, God doesn't, uh, the triune God doesn't need us, but why would God create? And the answer has to be, there's an overflowing of God's love that God wants to share God's love with other uh, creatures who can respond uh, to it. So that the very essence of the origination of the universe is not in some physical kind of phenomenon, but rather in the creative love of a personal being. So, so to use our kind of term, there's a sort of big bang of God's creative love in the universe that starts it going and then continues to uh, expand throughout eternity, that there's an ever-increasing uh, love of, of God being uh, expressed in eternity. And that's at the very center of reality. So creation is not simply something that happened long ago, uh, and then God you know, let, it, let it run, but rather uh, creation is an ongoing intimate and personal process. Uh, the creation is the very language of God. It has a relationship to God that our language has to us. It's not identical uh, with God, but it's an intimate expression of God's uh, person. Uh, so uh, in, in, in the King James Version, there, uh, sometimes the word love is, is uh, translated as a communi communication, that the universe is a communication of God's love and being and goodness. And, uh, so, and since the universe is new at every moment, the, the, at every moment, every, everything is changed in, in its relationships to everything else, uh, 
Uh, at every moment, God's love is being expressed in the sustaining of, uh, of, of the universe. And, and I think, uh, and, and I can say this from my own experience, I, I grew up in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church where uh, we heard a lot about the sovereignty of God. That was the central uh, doctrine of, of the classic Presbyterian uh, tradition. But it's often uh, came through, and maybe my fault, but it's the way it came through, as often as an abstract and sort of legal principle that God's sovereignty trumped everything else. And, and, and that, that seemed like a, an intellectual abstraction. Uh, whereas Edwards' emphasis on God's sovereignty as a loving personal dynamic, I think, can be exhilarating. And, and, and I suppose that, that there's something uh, similar happening in, in Edward's own experience, that he's moving from seeing the sovereignty of God as something objectionable and, and maybe even obnoxious uh, to seeing it as something that you can sweetly delight in because at the center of God's sovereignty is the overflowing of God's love, the dynamic of God is, is, is God's lovingness uh, that's constantly invigorating uh, the universe. And so uh, this breakthrough brings Edwards out uh, almost the, the exact opposite side uh, of uh, the, than, than the side that the deists are coming out on in the 18th century. Uh, the deists are distancing God, the creator God, from the universe that God created. And, and God is sort of distanced and retired. Whereas for Edwards, uh, God is intimately related with the universe and everything in it at every moment. That God is not only the creator, but is the sustainer of, of the universe. Edwards liked the, the verse, he who, he who can keep us from falling. That God, uh, if God withdrew God's creative uh, power from the universe, uh, there wouldn't be anything. And, and so uh, Edwards is, is, is seeing a, a universe uh, that's essentially personal. And it's also essentially a universe in which, as in the Newtonian physical universe, everything is related to everything else. But the essential relationships are personal relationships. And the real question in reality is, how are you related to the person who created uh, the universe uh, and, and who, has, uh, who, who has redeemed it uh, in, in Christ? That uh, that's the, the, the relationship. That, that determines everything else. Are you responding to the love of God and particularly to the redemptive love of God as manifested in Christ uh, or are you rejecting that love? It's a question of personal relationship that defines uh, everything else in the universe. Well, in contrast to, to Edward's view, in the world that Franklin helped create and which we uh, inhabit, uh, I think our tendency is to think of the universe as most essentially material and, and as run by uh, natural, natural laws that, that natural science uh, can uh, investigate. That We tend to think of, of the universe as, uh, as essentially uh, run by mechanistic kinds of principles. And in the, the, the dominant uh, secular outlooks of today, uh, basically uh, the idea is that we have an essentially dead universe in which uh, life somehow uh, pops up from time to time. And even I think uh, for people who believe in special creation, there's still a tendency for us to I think of, of, of the creation as something that happened long ago. Uh, the universe runs pretty much on its own uh, kind of uh, laws and principles that we can investigate by science, controlled by technology, and the like. 
Uh, and uh, so that uh, so much of our lives, uh, as I said before, practically speaking, is controlled by instrumental, uh, instrumental uh, reason. And then religious believers, I think we have a tendency to supplement those beliefs with beliefs in a higher spiritual reality and with a belief that God may intervene from time to time in matters of personal health or in a, in a, in a personal religious uh, experience. But, but most of the time, uh, practically speaking, we're living uh, in a universe uh, th that, that is uh, essentially impersonal. Uh, and so we, we tend to be dualistic. We tend to move back and forth between our, our practical lives organized according to uh, the principles of modernity and technique and the like, and our spiritual uh, lives which we, uh, with which we supplement uh, the, those uh, practical things with. Well, be that as it may, whatever, however we stand on that point, uh, Edward's starting point uh, in the triune God's ongoing love provides a, a basis for trying to cultivate an alternative sensibility. For Edward's, the most essential dimension of all reality is a spiritual and pers personal relational that pervades everything. And those are not beliefs that are just added on to the other things that we believe. Uh, but they are uh, rather the, the dimensions that define everything else uh, that we believe. Uh, all creation, uh, for Edwards, is an expression of the redemptive love of God in Christ. And so when we view nature around us, on, you go out on a beautiful day uh, such as uh, today, uh, one is not really seeing nature in its trueness unless one sees it in relationship to God and particularly in relationship to God's purpose in creation, uh, which is to show God's love ultimately in the, in, in the most perfect uh, love, uh, the love uh, of, of Christ uh, for, for the undeserving. So Edwards keeps a, a, a notebook uh, in which he records ways of thinking about the beauties of nature. And you see a, 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 a beauteous sky and you think of the holiness of God or uh, you, you, you uh, see uh, birth coming out, 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 of, uh, out, of, out of death and darkness. You think of the, the resurrection of Christ, all sorts of things to spark a sensibility to uh, seeing God's language, understanding, reading God's language, understanding how God is being communicated even in uh, the natural world uh, around us. And at the core of this sort of sensibility that Edwards is cultivating is a sensibility that our response to the sense of God speaking everywhere has to be affective. It has to involve our feelings. It's not just an abstraction uh, that, that we are uh, uh, contemplating, uh, but rather it's a sensibility. So, so Edwards is not uh, like an a, a, a early romantic who's simply uh, contemplating nature, uh, but rather he's seeing in nature uh, types of God's redemptive uh, love, that, that, that there is a, uh, a language uh, in nature and ultimately uh, it's uh, pointing toward Christ. And often he talks about the sensibility that we need to, to uh, read nature that way or to read all of life that way and that, with that personal dimension as something like uh, having be, being given a sixth sense. Excuse me. Of the bottle. <clears throat> it's, it's like having a sixth sense. Uh, it, his, uh, Edward's greatest sermon, his sermon called A Divine and Supernatural Light. And if you've never read Edward's, I think it's the, the best place uh, to, to, to start, and you can find it online or in any anthology. Just uh, 
and, and, and the, he uses the image of light to depict God's love, which is like a perfect beauty that's flowing from the center of reality. So here's a, a brief excerpt from the sermon. Uh, Edward says, he that is spiritually enlightened has this sense, truly apprehends and sees it, that is the beauty of God's love of, in Christ, or he has a sense of it. Uh, he does not merely rationally believe that God is glorious, but he or she has a sense of the gloriousness of God uh, in his heart. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, merely a speculative knowledge, but a sense of the heart as when there's a sense of beauty, amiable, amiableness or the sweetness of a thing. We delight in the presence or the idea of it. So Edwards is going on. And so there's a difference between believing a person is beautiful and having a sense of his or her beauty. The former may be obtained by hearsay, but the latter only by seeing the person. Uh, there's a wide difference between mere speculative, rational judging that something is excellent and having uh, a sense of its sweetness and its beauty. And I think the, the most helpful emphasis that you can find here uh, in, and for energizing evangelical theologies today is Edward's emphasis on beauty, on God's beauty. Uh, now, I think beauty is not a category that we hear a lot about in American evangelicalism today. Evangelicalism tends to be oriented toward the practical. Uh, and I think the problem is that although we all love beauty, uh, we tend to think of beauty as a passive sort of uh, quality, that, that, that we have a sort of platonic idea of beauty as pointing towards some transcendent ideal that it's for contemplation. And even uh, often I think uh, people who emphasize the beauty of liturgy uh, tend to, to think about it uh, in, in, in that sort of passive uh, kind of, of way. But for Edwards, beauty is at the heart of practicality. That is, of divinely motivated action. And God always pairs, excuse me, Edwards always pairs God's beauty Maybe God always pairs God's beauty with God's love. Uh, Edwards always pairs God's beauty with uh, the most active of God's attributes, and that is God's love. God's love and God's beauty are always paired. Edwards is a contemplative, but he's an active contemplative. All of white life is worship, uh, but the experience of God's beauty in Christ is a transformative personal experience that captures our affections, that captures our loves, and our loves and desires are the sources, after all, of all our actions. So I think the best summary phrase for Edward's theology and the encapsulation of the emphasis that if you take one thing home from, from what I've been saying is that uh, it's a theology of active beauty, a theology of active beauty, I think, captures the, the, the central essence of what Edwards has to say uh, to the contemporary world. Uh, what, one of Edwards' great emphasis, emphases is on the centrality of affections to genuine religious experience. Uh, the affections are central to us because they're what drives our actions, what, what we uh, truly love is what we uh, pursue. And what changes our affections then is experiencing the beauty of the love of Christ. So to experience beauty is immensely practical. It changes our affections and therefore changes our actions. Uh, I find Edward's view of God's love as overwhelming beauty to also be a, a useful way of explaining the paradox of God's grace and our choice uh, and hence of our actions. 
Uh, God, the Holy Spirit, is the source of the change of heart uh, that transforms us and our actions from being centered essentially around ourselves uh, to uh, being centered uh, around, even if imperfectly, to be centered around God and what God loves. Uh, and, and yet this holy, gracious change of heart uh, that takes place in conversion is, uh, is surely our act and our choice, even though it's uh, all the grace of God. And both these seemingly contradictory things can be true, I think, if we think of the power of beauty. Uh, when you perceive something beautiful, you are drawn to it. You're captivated by it. You don't really have a choice but to uh, love something that you perceive as, as beautiful. You, you, you're, you're, you're captured by it, but nonetheless, it's still your love, it's your response, it's your free, uh, your free choice. And I think we've all had that uh, sort of experience. And, and when we see uh, someone who's beautiful or a, a wonderful, a beautiful performance uh, about a decade ago, my wife and I were here in Chicago, uh, heard a Kathleen Battle uh, concert, and we were sitting, somehow we got tickets. Uh, we were sitting about as close as, as, as Doug is sitting uh, to me, and, and we were just both enthralled by the beauty of her performance. And uh, it, it illustrates the sense in which uh, you can be captivated by something. You, 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 you can't but respond in a, in, in a certain way. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's truly uh, your response. And I think uh, that's uh, a, a good account of the paradox of God's grace and our response uh, to it, that our hearts are, to, to use a contemporary uh, image that I think Edwards uh, would like, are like black holes that we tend to absorb love in, in it and use it for our own selfish purposes. Uh, whereas a transformed life is uh, a, one in which we are reflecting uh, the love of God and uh, it's radiating uh, out uh, from us. And for that to happen, uh, we need to be given eyes to see uh, and eyes to see uh, the love of Christ and the love of Christ is the perfect beauty. There's no higher beauty than the sacrificial love of a perfect being for those who are un undeserving. And if you get a glimpse of that uh, love, then it's a transformative uh, experience uh, that captivates uh, your heart. Edwards all, uh, uses these images of light. He also uses uh, musical uh, analogies to speak of this transforming beauty. Uh, and uh, because our, uh, of our depravity or our inborn refusal to love God, to respond to uh, God the way we should, uh, we are out of harmony with the uh, great symphony of God's love uh, that, that is uh, at the core of, of this uh, reality that's resounding through uh, reality. And our, our lives are, are made up of discordant notes, or for people who have it uh, to, uh, a bit together, we have our own little tunes, but they're out of harmony with uh, the great uh, uh, tune of God's uh, love. And, and so we must be given ears to hear. And once we hear the beauty of God's love and, and perceive the harmonies in the proper relationships of person in, in the universe, uh, then we're transformed by the, that ideal of love and drawn to it and that changes our love, changes our affections and changes our actions. Uh, so it's a theology of, as I say, active beauty. Uh, so we, we have in Edwards a wonderful theology of active beauty that keeps us focused on God. Not the abstract God of, uh, of uh, Greek ideal of beauty, uh, but ultimately the active beauty of the triune God's sacrificial love in Jesus Christ. Ultimately, it has a power to keep us focused on the beauty of the active love of Christ. And if we get a true glimpse of that beauty, 
our hearts are changed or captivated and will desire to have uh, the grace to truly love God and to love what God loves. And that changes the essential direction of our actions, uh, which will be driven uh, by uh, the love of beauty and by the beauty of love. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsden. It really is a privilege for uh, me to uh, be part of this occasion. Um, Dr. Sweeney, thank you for your vision in the establishment of the Jonathan Edwards Center here at Trinity. This is something wonderful um, that we rejoice in, and uh, I'm so grateful to be part of this uh, occasion today. And thank you especially for your vision to bring together uh, scholars and students and pastors um, who have a common love for Edwards and to do that for the good of the church. Uh, it's a privilege to be part of that and uh, we are grateful uh, to be here. Thank you, Dr. Marsden, for all that you have done to fan the flames of renewed uh, interest in, in Edwards. Uh, through the writings of Edwards, many of us in pastoral ministry have found uh, a route into the deep things of the gospel of God for which we are uh, so grateful. Thank you for that. And for your paper today, thank you. This has been stimulating to our minds. It has been warming to our hearts. Uh, and I believe it has drawn attention to an issue that is of huge practical significance uh, in uh, the church today. Um, I've been asked uh, to respond to Dr. Marsden's paper by applying the theme of the paper to the life of the church and then providing a bridge uh, for our discussion uh, together. Uh, reading your paper in preparation for today, Dr. Marsden, I was uh, reminded that uh, some time ago, uh, one of my colleagues um, offered some feedback uh, that he had received from, he said, a longtime member of the congregation with regards to my preaching. It's always good to get some good feedback. And this was the comment. When Colin talks about the beauty of the Lord, this man had said, I have absolutely no idea what he is talking about. Um, I was reminded as I pondered that um, of A.W. Tozer's comment on post-war evangelicalism when he said that the whole transaction of religious conversion has been made mechanical and spiritless. Faith, Tozer says, may now be exercised without a jar to the Adamic ego, and Christ may be, quote, received without creating any special love for him in the soul of the receiver, so that the man is, quote, saved, but he is not hungry or thirsty after God. Uh, I have found your identification of deism uh, really as an enemy of vibrant spiritual life to be profoundly uh, helpful. Uh, reading your paper, I was reminded of Christian Smith's uh, study of faith among 3,000 students and his memorable description of that faith as moralistic, therapeutic deism. Uh, Al Mohler has described this, that is, moralistic, therapeutic deism, as the greatest competitor to biblical Christianity. And he says, we now face, this is Moeller, we now face the challenge of evangelizing a nation that largely considers itself Christian, overwhelmingly believes in some deity, considers itself fervently religious, but has virtually no connection to historical Christianity. More broadly, it seems to me that the man-centered mindset so common in much of modern evangelicalism really brings the spirit of deism into the doctrine of salvation by presenting a Christ who dies and rises in order to set up a way of salvation, but then, in your words, Dr. Marsden, essentially retires from active duty. Um, instead of an active savior invading and intercepting human lives, we have an essentially passive, though vaguely benevolent savior who sort of waits and who watches to see what we will do. Um, clearly, by placing Edwards alongside Franklin, and, and that contrast is so fascinating, um, 
you have provoked a question that I think is profoundly relevant for the church. What will cause a man to move from the religion of a Franklin to the faith of an Edwards? Um, what might help a man who has a mechanical and spiritless faith to discover the life and the joy of Edward's vision of God? How might a high school student or a college student who knows nothing beyond moral therapeutic deism begin to savor for him or his or herself the beauty uh, of Christ? Um, Clearly, the journey, as it were, from Franklin to Edwards involves a profound work of the Holy Spirit, and any formula would fall into um, the mechanistic error from which we are seeking deliverance. But from Scripture and from experience, I'd like simply to suggest three means by which God may deliver us from a mechanistic faith and cause us to behold the beauty of His Son. The first of these is the proclamation of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul describes two radically different spiritual conditions in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. In the first, a person cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, and the cause of this condition is that the God of this world has blinded human eyes. Two verses later, the apostle describes a very different condition in which a person enjoys the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And the cause of this condition is that God has made his light to shine into the heart, opening previously blind eyes to the glory of Christ. But by what means does God make his light shine in human hearts? In the intervening verse, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, Paul gives the answer. We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Applying these scriptures to the focus of our discussion, we might say that God moves people from the religion of a Franklin into the faith of an Edwards through proclamation that exalts Jesus Christ as Lord. This is not to suggest that all who hear such preaching will behold the beauty of the Lord, but it is to say that God opens eyes that were previously blinded to his glory through ministry that exalts the Savior. In a culture that is deeply shaped by Franklin's worldview, it should not surprise us if people, and especially business people, urge their pastors to focus preaching on practical takeaways. You know, the kind of thing, give me the bottom line. Where's the action point? What's the takeaway? Sermons that end with an exhortation to speak to a stranger this week, spend 20 minutes with your wife talking about your finances, or write a card to say thank you to a friend, appeal to many because of their practicality. But a constant diet of this kind of ministry reinforces the mechanistic mindset from which people who crave such preaching desperately need to be delivered. The outcomes of Edward's preaching go far beyond practical takeaways and include the forming of faith, the deepening of repentance, the advancing of holiness, the strengthening of perseverance, the encouraging of mortification, the igniting of prayer, the finding of hope, and the renewing of thanksgiving, all of which involve expansion of the soul through fresh glimpses of the glory of Christ. The pressure will always be on the church to make the message about the things with which the unbeliever can connect family, money, purpose, navigating experiences of life, and so forth and so on. But the mystery of God's grace is that God makes his light to shine through the proclamation of the gospel of Christ, whose glory the unbeliever cannot see. Here is the great paradox of ministry. If we preach to the unbeliever what he can see, he won't see. Our calling is to preach what he can't see, so that he will see the preaching of Jesus Christ. Second, the humbling of a Christian believer. Reading Franklin's autobiography, and I appreciated the stimulus of your paper, Dr. Marsden, to, uh, to do this, I was struck reading his autobiography by the total absence, so far as I could see, of any sense of sin. 
Franklin speaks at length about his bold and arduous project of arise, arriving at moral perfection, a project involving the ordered cultivation of 13 virtues diligently pursued over many years. It's so fascinating, uh, your contrast with, with Edwards and his notebook about the glories of God in creation. And here's Franklin with his notebook uh, uh, plotting his progress with his own virtues. It's a fascinating contrast. Franklin admits, I was surprised to find uh, myself so much fuller of faults than I had imagined. But then he comforts himself in adding, but I had the satisfaction of seeing them diminish. The contrast with Edward's pervasive sense of sin is absolutely stunning. The gospel addresses the sense of sin, and in a helpful image deployed by James Denny, it operates as a lever pivots on a fulcrum. The Holy Spirit's work of glorifying Christ to the soul coincides with the minist his ministry of convincing the soul of sin. Preaching that exalts the Savior also humbles sinners, and seeing the depth of our own sin produces a love for Christ and a tenderness towards others. The Bible places the sparkling jewel of the love of God in the stark setting of the universality of human sin, the wrath of God, and the substitutionary, substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Abstracted from these realities, language about the love of God loses its redeeming power. In Luke chapter 7, our Lord established the principle that the one who has been forgiven little loves little, and the one who has been forgiven much loves much. Peter experienced the love of Christ most deeply after he sinned most grievously. This is not to argue for pursuing sin as a means of spiritual growth, but it is my observation from pastoral experience that God often uses our failures and the calamities of our lives to break the self-absorbed shell of moralistic religion. In the mercy of God, the moments of our greatest failures may be doorways from a mechanistic religion to a living faith that apprehends the love of God. And then thirdly, the suffering of a righteous man or woman. Nothing assaults the notion of a mechanistic universe with more devastating power than the suffering of a righteous man or woman. Job's comforters, if I can put it this way, belong to the world of Franklin. To them, it was the invariable moral law of the universe that it goes well with the good and that suffering is invariably an effect of personal sin. And Job's great struggle was with the freedom of God to bring suffering and pain into the experience of a righteous man. But out of that agony of soul came new glimpses of the glory of God and new delight in his sovereign power. The man who had said that he had absolutely no idea what the preacher was talking about when I spoke of the beauty of Christ, invited me sometime later to breakfast. The picture-perfect family that he had imagined for himself hadn't turned out as he hoped, and he wanted to know why. He brought his journal, and he showed me pages, thick book, of how he had been writing his thoughts and his reflections. Look at what I've been doing, he said to me over the table. I've been writing every day. Now, why is all this happening to me? Franklin's worldview was cracking for him right there and then. I do not yet know how his story will end, but I believe that his anguish could be the beginning of hope. By contrast, I will never forget gathering one evening with 12 couples from our church, each of whom had experienced the devastating loss of a child. Each told their story. There were many tears, and there was a sweet savor of the presence of Christ as we prayed together. Driving home, I was overwhelmed by the single thought. Here are 12 couples who have experienced excruciating pain. Their loss remains, and not one of them has an answer to the question, why? 
and yet they all love Christ. God had created a tenderness of spirit through the sufferings of these people. In their journey through unspeakable pain, these believers had come to treasure Christ, and they had learned to delight in his grace. That night I came to the conclusion that of all the service we offer to the Savior, the work that may be most significant for eternity is to love Christ still in the face of unexplained suffering. Thank you, Dr. Marsden, for giving us a new framework for understanding a major challenge that we face in ministry today. The reality that you've reminded us of is that the pews of our churches are occupied by thousands who have seen little more than Franklin. May many come to savor with Edwards the beauty and the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Marston. <clears throat>
sort of showbiz kind of dimension of, of so much of, of, of American evangelicalism throughout history, you know, just doesn't lead to a, you know, a place where beauty is going to be a, an easy category to talk about. The only comment that, that I have uh, uh, on this is, is in relation to the strange position that uh, all of us uh, who preach um, and all of us in, in engaging in evangelism more widely find ourselves in. Um, we preach Jesus Christ as Lord, and the glories of this Christ are precisely what the unbeliever cannot see. Uh, so why, why in the world would I get up in a pulpit and speak something that I know that the unbeliever can't see? He doesn't get it. And the reason is that, that Paul says, look, it's only by the proclamation of the glory of Christ that those who do not see the glory of Christ will find that, that God shines the light into their hearts so that they do see. So th th there's this strange enigma, um, and yet it, it, it is a wonderful mystery of, of, uh, of the ministry that as as you speak what the unbeliever cannot see, God uses that to open the eyes so that they do see it. And they won't see it unless you speak of what they cannot see. Um, that's actually an encouragement to keep speaking about spiritual things. Hi. Dr. Marsden, thank you very much for your great presentations, and Dr. Smith as well. I so appreciate it. Uh, I, I teach philosophy, and I'm very interested in the ongoing debate about the environment. And uh, there are some who would pit the stewardship mentality of how can uh, the environment and its, and its beautiful aspects be used to help improve human welfare over against uh, kind of an, an inherent respect for the beauty of God that is even rooted in the idea of uh, the whole creation being one giant organism or Gaia. How do you think Edwards might address um, this, this concern for beauty? Um, in, in light of um, uh, perhaps some of, the, some of the ravages of an instrumental approach to the environment and its beauty, and on the other side, some of the excesses of a heretical idolatry uh, about the creation. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, as, as I said, I'd, I'd like the, the, the idea of seeing nature as or the creation as the language of God is, is a way of avoiding sort of the idolatry of, 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 of you know, about nature and, 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 it's, and it, it's also fallen that, that, that so it's not it, it, it's not in its perfect condition so there's a, you know, Edwards would be seeing things through the lens that the essential reality that you're dealing with is uh, a reality where, where, where God is speaking through the, the natural you know, created, created order. But that doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to, to yield any clear sort of policy Direction that that you go. I mean, you you, you might, you know, I mean, there, there there are parts of, you know, there might be beautiful trees, but Edwards chopped them down to, you know, for practical purposes to heat, they heat the, his his home. So uh, I'm not sure that 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 you get a, a more than a sort of an attitude that, uh, is you. you that has a, a, a proper respect for, for created things as expressions of God, but, but you're not deifying them. Hi, uh, I'm Brandon O'Brien, a doctoral student here. Um, I'm curious about the role of preaching propositions or preaching doctrine. Um, it seems like a word neither of you has used necessarily is kind of Christian imagination and the idea of uh, an imagination or a sensibility that allows people to see reality behind the material world. And I wonder, um, do, do narratives, do preaching narratives of Christ do that better? Or do the Psalms do that better? Or can you preach doctrine or propositions 
uh, in a way that captures the imagination or are propositions necessarily practical? Um, not sure if I'm asking that the best way, but I think a lot of people may associate application and proposition, and I'm wondering how you, how you might take that. Just at a very simple level, I find it so helpful to keep saying to myself, the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. And, you know, um, you know a British person can't speak for more than five minutes without quoting C.H. Spurgeon, so, you know, uh, here it comes. Spurgeon used to say to his students, you know, uh, from, from every town and hamlet in England, there is a, a, a road to London. And he says, from every text in Scripture, there is a path to, to, to Christ. And he says, your job when you're, when you're preaching is, is to find that path, and, uh, be, because we are to proclaim him. And Spurgeon, because he was Spurgeon, added, and, and if I can't find a path, I'll jump the hedges and go across the ditches to get there. And um, so uh, um, we want to deploy the, 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 the whole of Scripture. The other thing that comes to my mind um, with regards to your question about preaching is I've been so helped by a statement of uh, Dr. Lloyd-Jones. He says, great preaching derives from great themes. And he encouraged um, uh, in, in his model of preaching to, to look for what the great doctrinal truth uh, is. So I've... That's a very simple way of approaching it. When I look at a passage, I think, uh, where does the central message of this passage belong in Grudem's theology? What, what big doctrine does this belong to, and how does it connect with Christ? And uh, uh, to me, these are the things that are, um, uh, are, are important in that declaration, whatever the form of Scripture. I don't know, George, if you want to add anything about... Jonathan Edwards' sermons, I don't know what it was like exactly to listen to them live, but uh, it, countless people have read Edwards' sermons over the years and had their spiritual imaginations turned on by the experience. Have you done some reflecting on what it was about his approach to preaching that engendered the right, healthiest kinds of wonder in people? Yeah, I... Um... I mean, for one thing, Ed, Edwards does not use narrative. He never refers to himself, I think, or almost never, and almost never I mean, he uses narrative beyond basic recounting of a, of, of a scriptural uh, story. But I mean, unlike Whitfield, who is sort of dramatizing. Uh, Dramatizing things, but but Edwards uses the power of a of a relentless logic, and and it's amazing that you know the people his his audience was trained to 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 listen to that kind of sermons and 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 sort of taking the implications of things that that people did believe and 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 then say you know basically in, say, you know if if you believe this then you have to believe these things and just keep repeating it in 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 very various ways till there's no there's no escaping the consequence and it's a kind of preaching i i think it's very very difficult in in most contemporary settings i think it also came through with the intensity of his personality. And you can see that e even in just reading the sermons to some extent, that it's just, I mean, he, he just see, he has his penetrating intellect that's following the, the implications of things to their, you know, the inescapable conclusions. I think Steve was next. Dr. Marsden, when you uh, were talking about uh, Franklin's uh, use of technology to make things better. I, I was struck by uh, uh, one of Edwards' resolutions. I think it's uh, very early on in his list where he, you know, he says uh, resolve to, to use every new contrivance or, or invention to the glory of God. And if, if I recall, he must have made that when he was about 19. And I'm wondering if, if, uh, if he ever nuanced that, if he ever developed that, if he ever... Uh, modified that in any, you know, any of his later writing or teaching? 
Doug probably knows more than I do, but I don't think, it's, that's one of the frustrating things about doing an Edwards biography. He doesn't, he, he's focused in his ministry and he doesn't talk about you know, that, that diary you know, that, or those resolutions. You get a little insight into what he's thinking about personally and in, 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 in the diary, which he keeps for a few years. But uh, there's, there's precious little on sort of that kind of uh, general, general statement in, in, in the, rest of, the rest of what he does. I mean, even, even when he writes to his children, you know, we miss you and we're concerned for the state of your soul. And then it's, he, he's speaking as pastor. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know exactly what you have in mind with regard to contrivances, and I don't think Edwards writes a lot later on about using new contrivances to promote the gospel, but he is somebody who is surprisingly open to trying some new things, particularly during the era of the Great Awakening. In uh, George's biography, there's some pretty helpful stuff on the ways in which Edwards decided to use small group ministry uh, the ways in which Edwards decided controversially among some to incorporate hymnody in Sunday afternoon services and so on. So he doesn't write a lot about this and kind of develop the kind of the new measures, uh, his sort of approach to promoting the gospel in his day. But he's, you know, he's not just sort of stuck in his ways from beginning to end in ministry either. Yeah, J.K. Hi, Dr. Martin. Um uh, my own uh, dissertation topic is on uh, theological aesthetics, uh, divine beauty, fittingly enough. So I'd be, I'm curious to know um, what were the primary uh, sources of influence or, or sources uh, that informed uh, Edward's beauty, um, uh, theory of beauty? Uh, and also um, within that, if you could maybe give a, a comment to what extent the Cambridge Platonists uh, that he was familiar with at the time also informed or, or, or not his understanding of uh, theological aesthetics? Yeah, well, one, I'm sure if you've done a dissertation on this, you know a lot more about it than, than I do. And you, I mean, I, about what I know or what I knew when I was thinking about Looking into this, you know, this Cambridge Platonists do seem to have an influence, and and, and Edwards is not alone in, in people in his Puritan precedents of people talking about beauty and so forth. And as as everything in Edwards, you can find precedents for it. I think it's his synthesis that's that, that's um, it was, it's, it, uh, where his genius. Is and 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 I, I think, Edwards, pretty consistently, appropriates things, and brings them into a more strictly Calvinistic kind of framework, and, and more strictly I don't know the Cambridge Platonists uh, very well at, at this at, at this point, but and he brings them into this this Trinitarian. Sort of, sort of framework, and, and so he's taking the the, the the philosophical frameworks of the day and bringing them into in, into this Calvinistic framework. I think I think that's the same. I know you had a discussion when Richard Muller was here about the freedom of the will, and and I think I I, I my view of Edwards is he's putting the traditional doctrines in 18th century language, but he's not. Essentially, changing the doctrines, and I think so. He's that—that that would be my take. He's appropriating things, this you know, beauty as a category, uh, and and but putting it very much in a traditional Augustinian framework. Take one more question. Uh, I'd be very interested in both of your perspectives. Dr. Marsden, you as a longtime uh, churchman and Colin, you as a pastor and preacher, what's the role of biblical theology in presenting and helping people to see the glories and beauty of Christ uh, 
in the preaching of God's word. You know, Colin, you, you said a little bit about putting it in the context of Grudem's theology. Um, I'd be interested more in the angle of put it in the context of you know, Voss's redemptive history or something like that. How do, you, how do you see the role of biblical theology clarifying and presenting the beauties of Christ in the context of biblical theology and redemptive history? I'll go first simply to give the uh, last word to uh, Dr. Uh, Morriston, and I think you've made an excellent point. That's another way of thinking about it, and um, uh, thank you for raising that. Well, Ed, Ed, Edward's universe is, is, is very typological. Every, everything is, is, is a type of Christ, and so he, 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 when he's taking notes on Scripture, everything is types of Christ. So I see it as certainly anticipating you know, the, the kind of thing you get in in, in, in Voss or, 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 or the like, and you know, every, and I, I, I was, went to Westminster Seminary and Edmund Clowney was my teacher on uh, homiletics and, you know, he, he emphasized the biblical theological was Christ preached, and it's the same as you, Colin, quoted from Spurgeon. So I think that, that that's integral to, to Edward's outlook. I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, we'll stick around for just a few minutes in case anybody wants an informal word with Dr. Marston or Pastor Smith. Uh, but why don't we conclude by thanking them again for being here with us today. <laughs>